written a lot of thought-provoking books. But this one, I think, will be talked about for years to come. The subtitle is <clears throat> America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900 to 1941. <clears throat> it's the story of what happened uh, when the United States retreated from the international system <clears throat> into isolation. <clears throat> uh, reading the book it changed my understanding of 20th century history, and it may change yours. Uh, I learned uh, in the eighth grade uh, social studies, uh, for example, that the Versailles Treaty failed because Woodrow Wilson didn't have Republicans in his delegation in, in uh, France. <clears throat> well, the real reason it failed is something different, and that's what Dr. Kagan documents here. It's that Henry Cabot Lodge, the Republican chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was determined to make it fail. Woodrow Wilson is rehabilitated in these pages. Um, also brought to life is the role the United States played <clears throat> through being a non-player, basically, in the rise of Adolf Hitler, in the Munich Agreement selling out Czechoslovakia in 1938, in the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact of 1939. <clears throat> uh, the book is also a very good read. Uh, I, I finished it last night. <laughs> um, I couldn't put it down. It was that good. Uh, Dr. Kagan is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution uh, and the author of many books. And the, and the, the titles <laughs> indicate that he, he takes big, big topics on. Uh, the World America Made, The Jungle Grows Back, and the Return to History uh, and the End of Dreams are just a few of his titles. Dangerous Nation, America's Place in the World from Earliest Days in the Dawn to the Dawn of the 20th Century, that's a pretty long title, um, was published in 2006. And that was the first book in a trilogy uh, of which The Ghost at the Feast is the second volume. <clears throat> he served at the, uh, it, it took him 13 years to write this, by the way. And uh, he, part, part three has not yet begun. <clears throat> but uh, let us hope that he does it, uh, because it, if, if this is any indication, we need to read it. <clears throat> even before it's written. <laughs> um, he's, he served in the State Department and the policy planning staff. Uh, he wrote speeches for, uh, the, for the late Secretary of State, uh, George Schultz. Um, and he was Deputy Secretary of State in, for Inter-American Affairs. He's a graduate of Yale, Harvard, and American University, where he earned his PhD. Dr. Kagan, the podium is yours. Thank you so much, Roy, and thank you all for coming out here to talk about foreign policy. Every time I see Americans who want to talk about foreign policy, I just want to give you a big kiss because uh, <laughs> it's not always forefront in our minds, but, but these days it is, and, and uh, for obvious reasons. There are things going on in the world that I think have caught Americans' attention, and rightly so. Uh, but as we look out at this world and as we think about how the United States should respond to the various challenges from Russia, from China, from Iran, and elsewhere, uh, you know, I think I find anyway that there's a great deal of confusion about what exactly America's interests are. We talk a lot about American interests. Um, I think we've all learned from international relations theorists in our college studies and elsewhere uh, that interests are supposed to be about pretty much tangible things, your national security, your economic well-being. Uh, and then, then there's something called values. So you, you can look after your interests or you can look after your values. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. That's the standard take. Uh, but as I look at the American response to Ukraine, uh, and, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And by the American response, and I'm going to have to be careful all the way through this talk as I was throughout my book, it's hard to talk about the American response because, of course, Americans are divided on, along many lines, and one of the lines that they're divided along is, is about foreign policy. Uh, but for those who do feel that the United States has interests in uh, worth, uh, worth defending in Ukraine in the way that America is currently defending, it's interesting to break down what do we mean by those interests? Uh, would it be a, a direct threat to America's immediate security and economic well-being if Ukraine fell to Russia? Um, I think the answer to that simple and narrow question is no. America could survive perfectly well 
uh, with Ukraine falling to Russia. After all, we lived uh, throughout the Cold War with Russia, with Moscow in control of much more than Ukraine uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. So why, uh, what is the interest here? And, and clearly, it seems to me at least that when people talk about the fact that America, Mitch McConnell says Americans have vital interests in Ukraine, what does he mean by that? Um, I think what he means is that America has interest in defending a certain kind of world order, a certain kind of world system that has uh, various qualities to it, like liberalism and democracy, and also the way nations are uh, treat each other, and whether they respect sovereignty or whether aggression is something that is permitted. Um, I think that is what Americans are responding to, their concern, and I think legitimate concern, that the liberal world that, that America is, has been uniquely involved in creating is at some risk, whether from Russia or from China or from both, and perhaps from others as well. And I think that lies behind uh, much of the public sentiment in favor of doing something about Ukraine. But already, we're not talking about interests, as I think we learn in school uh, what the definition of interests are. And so this is the area that I have been trying to explore, really, for my whole adult life, which is trying to, under, trying to unravel the puzzle of what makes Americans tick in foreign policy. Uh, and it's been an interesting adventure, and, and uh, I mostly have uh, set about uh, trying to write a three-volume history. If, as Roy says, I live, along, live long enough to accomplish the third volume, which is very much in doubt. Uh, but but, but the, the reason I embarked on this was to educate myself, to try to understand as best I could what it is that motivates America, what it is that makes Americans uh, act in the world. And let me tell you, it is a very complicated story full of paradoxes and contradictions. And I, I know, obviously, I'm not going to do the whole story for you right here tonight. So you're going to have to get the abridged version. But maybe in our Q&A, we can tease out some of these questions uh, or discuss really anything you want. I'm very eager to hear uh, what you all have to say about America's foreign policy. Uh, but let me go back and start uh, uh, where I always like to start, which is deep in history. Not all the way back, because that's another volume that I wrote another in another decade. Uh, but in this case, going back to really the late 19th century, there was a uh, the, one of the longest serving British historians, uh, a British British. Uh, ambassadors to the United States was also a historian and a political commentator named James Bryce. And he wrote a very famous book, it was famous at one time in the 1880s, called The American Commonwealth, which was his effort to sort of describe for his fellow Englishmen and women uh, what it is that America is all about. And he, he made a couple of interesting points about foreign policy. One of the things he said was, the American foreign policy making apparatus is a disaster compared to European uh, governments. European governments were poised for war at all times, and they had, and they had to be because they were in fact at war a tremendous amount of uh, the time. And so they had uh, executive, uh, 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 they had governmental systems where a great deal of power was, was concentrated in the monarch or the executive, which allowed them to move quickly uh, in response to potential threats, move quickly with their military, which was always in a state of high readiness. The peacetime army of Russia in 1900 was over 700,000 soldiers. That was the peacetime army. Um, Britain, in a, which was an island um, and, and basically ruled the world by its navy, nevertheless kept uh, something between 200 and 300,000 uh, soldiers ready to deal with the many contingencies that they did have to deal with on the continent of Europe. Uh, the United States uh, in 1900 had about 20,000 uh, soldiers, uh, and they were barely able to, to accomplish their mission, which was chasing Native Americans around uh, the West uh, in various forms. Um, and, and, and that was it. Uh, 
Uh, and nor if, if the United States had ever gotten into a war at that time, uh, would it have been, it would have taken a long time for it to gear up uh, to deal with it. But of course, the United States didn't have to face the prospect of war. And this is the thing that James Bryce said. He said, the Americans don't need to have an efficient foreign policy making apparatus. They don't need to have a well-functioning executive when it comes to foreign policy because, as he said at the time, America sails on a summer sea. Uh, we, it, it is invulnerable to outside attack. It watches the rest of the world. He's very poetic. Uh, in the way that the Epicurean gods look down on the human race, which, as you know from your reading of Epicurus, was with a great deal of indifference. Um, and so uh, that was the mode. Uh, Karl Schurz, who was a famous uh, German-American politician in the late 19th century, said that America could not get into a war except by its own choosing. And that was true. And so you had a country at the end of the 19th century that was... Uh, not theoretically or essentially, I'm not going to use an adverb, it was invulnerable to foreign attack and invasion. Even with its 20,000 uh, person army, uh, the British intelligence services at the time said an invasion of the North American continent would be the largest disaster we could possibly engage in, which makes sense if you think about not only the size of the continent that the United States occupied, but the advanced nature of the population, the incredible decentralization of the American system. In France, if you took Paris, you took France. In the United States, if you took Washington, I don't know what you got. Um, so, so America really was invulnerable. And that, you know, if you as a country are invulnerable, you have to ask yourself, why in the world would you get involved out there in that mess uh, of an international situation, which was by the way, uh, a great mess in the late 19th and early 20th century. You had uh, empires were on the march, uh, battling for territory in Asia, uh, in, the, in, in Africa, in the Middle East. Um, and the United States, which, as Roy Gutman can tell you better than anybody else, uh, got into the habit of intervening in the Western Hemisphere a great deal. A lot of the reason was they feared that this imperial competition would, would come to the Western Hemisphere and involve the United United States. So the, uh, the, uh, as one of uh, the many paradoxes of American foreign policy, the United States wound up intervening constantly in the Western Hemisphere so that it would not have to become involved in the larger world. That was ultimately, uh, I believe, their, their main objective. So you have this country sitting in relative uh, state of invulnerability, and that includes economics, by the way, because although Americans were very interested in trade, certain parts of the American economy were involved in the international trade, the United States was the most self-sufficient economy of all the major economies in the world. The United States, 5% uh, of, of its GDP came from foreign trade, 5%. Um, by the way, it's not that, it wasn't that much more for many, many decades afterwards. Um, you know, whereas Britain was a trading nation and depended on international trade for its very existence because Britain could not feed its own people with its own capabilities and needed its empire to help feed it, um, you know, the United States did not require that. So the United States was incredibly self-sufficient. If you want to say, why is it that Americans are reluctant to go overseas? That is your answer. And why, and, and in a certain sense, why should they be? Uh, but of course, as we know, the United States did get into a war of its own choosing uh, uh, almost immediately after Carl Schurz made that comment by getting in involved in the intervention in Cuba, uh, which, by the way, has been uh, in, in the category of things that you were taught in history classes that are wrong. Uh, the intervention in Cuba was not driven by imperialist motives. It was driven by humanitarian motives. Um, and I can spell that out for you. Or you could read the book even better. Um, <laughs> And what was driving Americans at that time was clearly uh, a, a morality, belief, and a sense of responsibility. 
there was this very strong feeling that here was this humanitarian catastrophe in Cuba, and it was a humanitarian catastrophe. 20% uh, of the Cuban population died as a result of famine and war, et cetera, all as a result of Spanish policies. Um, and so Americans felt that given their great power, because by the 1900, by early, by 1900, the United States may have had an army on the size of 20,000 or so, but it was at the same time already the world's most uh, largest and most dynamic economy. Uh, everyone knew that, that the United States had become and was going to become the dominant economic power in the world. And everybody knew that economic power, if one chooses to, can be translated into military power. So the United States stood uh, in the eyes of everybody as an enormous potential great power. But Americans themselves did not necessarily think of themselves that way. Uh, but they were conscious of their power, and they knew that they felt, therefore, that if they had the power to bring this suffering to an end, and given how close it was, 90 miles from American shores, how could the United States justify not doing anything? Uh, you know, when you read about Americans in this period in most history books that you hear about how hysterical they were and how crazy they were and how they got all fired up by the yellow press, et cetera, et cetera. But look at ourselves today. Look at how outraged Americans get when they see a humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in other parts of the world. Imagine if there were a humanitarian catastrophe of that magnitude happening 90 miles from our shores today. Would, would not many Americans think that perhaps we ought to do something about it? And so that was the first instance where, despite the fact that the United States was completely secure, Americans nevertheless uh, because of their beliefs and because of their sense, a growing sense of responsibility, uh, undertook to and get involved in an intervention and wound up rather accidentally acquiring the Philippines. And it is often thought, I, we can talk about that too, or you could read the book again, um, if you, if you want to delve into that. But suffice to say that, um, even after the, this enormous ex, you know, explosion of American power in, this, in the Spanish-American War and the acquisition of a colony in the Philippines, even then, uh, Americans were not thinking of themselves as a world power. And when Theodore Roosevelt became president, and you know, I know how you all think about Theodore Roosevelt because this is another way you've been misled by historians into thinking that he was a trigger-happy guy who couldn't wait for the next war. But as president, he didn't fire a single shot in anger in seven years. And in fact, he did his best to defuse potential conflicts, both with Japan uh, and in Europe, when he mediated between the French and the Germans over the Moroccan crisis. Um, what, what, in, the, in those years, people like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson represented what we would call the internationalist end of American thinking about foreign policy. And their sense of it was, I think the way they put it was, with great power comes great responsibility. But what did they mean by that? Uh, if you look at what Roosevelt uh, was writing uh, and, people, and people who worked for him, like John Hay, uh, in this period, the most they had in mind was that there should be a kind of global consortium of great powers, Germany, France, Britain, Russia, and the United States, and each one of them would basically manage their own regions uh, in, in this kind of global effort to advance quote unquote civilization, which is how they put it at that time. And so even, even those who were most internationalist and most uh, sort of moved by issues of like responsibility, the most responsibility they could envision was the United States taking care of its neighborhood while other great powers took care of their neighborhoods. So you can only imagine then when World War I breaks out uh, what the effect is, uh, what the, the, com the number of contradictory effects that the outbreak of war had on an American public that up until then uh, was, was uh, taken with America's role in the world, but still was thinking that the rest of the world should, should manage itself. Obviously, they had to, to, to make a choice, that there was a real fork in the road.
Now, let me back up a little bit because we need to get into the question of why was America sailing on a summer sea and whether that condition continued into the 20th century. Uh, and the answer to that is the Americans were, un, un, I think, quite unaware of this, but it was nevertheless true, that America was a beneficiary of a very successful world order that was upheld by British naval power and had been basically since the defeat of Napoleon, which also defeated the French, which was the Britain's largest competitor, and also defeated the Spanish, which was the other great competitor to the British Empire. And for most of the 19th century, the British basically had the world to themselves uh, and, and extended this enormous naval capacity, which had the effect because of what British interests were, of creating a, a, a essentially a liberal, especially a liberal economic order in the international system. The British, because they were a trade dependent nation and because they relied on both selling to and receiving supplies from their empire, had an interest in maintaining an open trading system defended by the Royal Navy. The Americans were the be direct beneficiaries of that, and they were also beneficiaries of the fact that the international system was, up until a certain point, quite stable. Uh, there was a rough balance of power on the European continent through most of the 19th century, and the British dominated the seas. And that was a fairly stable order, which required from Americans absolutely nothing. They were the leading beneficiaries of this order. They became the richest country in the world under this order, and yet they had no role in upholding this order, which was, of course, the most wonderful situation you could possibly imagine. And why should Americans not want to perpetuate that situation as long as humanly possible? Unfortunately for Americans, uh, that world order the British-led world order, which had as a major element the balance of power on the continent of Europe, fell apart by the, by the beginning of the 20th century. On the one hand, the unification of Germany in 1871 created a state in the heart of Europe that proved to be too big for Europe. As soon as Germany was unified and as soon as Bismarck, who was trying to keep things relatively cool despite the unification of Germany, as soon as Bismarck was gone, his successor, uh, who was basically Wilhelm II, uh, had all kinds of ambitions for this new powerful Germany. And beginning in 1870, which was, by the way, marked by a defeat of France, uh, in the Franco-Prussian War, uh, Germany was rising as an economic power, as a demographic power, and ultimately as a military power, so that the balance of power in Europe was upset and the British were no longer able to maintain it in the way that they had before. Simultaneously in East Asia, which up until then had been lacking any indigenous major power, the only powers that counted out there in the 19th century were Britain, France, uh, and other, and, and, and Russia, uh, really more than anybody else. China, of course, was flat on its back, having been invaded by the British Empire, uh, having been essentially carved up and parceled out among the various empires. And so there was no great power at all in East Asia when Britain established this global hegemony. Uh, that all changed with the rise of Japan uh, and the Meiji reforms of the late 19th century, during which Japan modernized, which meant militarized, uh, and, and uh, in addition to uh, copying many Western approaches, because their belief was if they couldn't copy the West, they would be defeated by the West. And so you had Japan rising, you had Germany rising, and you had this island power, Britain, which up until then had dominated everything and now was no longer able to do so. And the proof that it was no longer able to do so was World War I uh, and, and, and where World War I was going. So here was the United States, the great beneficiary of this liberal order that it had no role and no responsibility for upholding, and suddenly that liberal world order is now collapsing, and Americans, as I said, are now at this fork in the road. Are they going to let this liberal world order that they had benefited from collapse and be overrun by a regime? And this is important to remember that the German regime in World War I 
was an ideologically oriented uh, government which believed in the primacy of the state and the ruler over individual rights and was overtly and openly hostile to liberalism and democracy. And the war at the time, again, I'm, I'm attacking international relations theorists left and right, but one of the, one of the wonderful things the international relations theorists have done is drained World War I of the moral content. Because believe me, the people fighting in that war on both sides believed they were fighting uh, a war of principle on behalf of a particular worldview about how human beings should be organized. And so what Americans saw correctly, as Britons also saw, as French also saw, was a, a powerful uh, militaristic autocratic regime that by 1916 had conquered almost all of Europe already. And that was the question that Americans ultimately faced. There were multiple reasons why the United States got into World War I. Um, but I argue in this book that the overall reason was precisely that they, Americans, or at least a majority of Americans, feared that the liberal world that they had enjoyed, they finally came to realize was at stake and was in danger of being overrun. And if you, if, if you want to know why the United States got involved, in my view, that is the major reason why. And the, intro, the introduction of the United States then into the international uh, situation changed everything. Uh, Prior to America's entry, the balance of power in Europe had shifted in favor of Germany. That was just a reality. Germany was more powerful than Britain, France, and Russia combined, and was beating them in the war in World War I, just as we would also beat them in World War II. And so the only thing that was going to change that outcome was the introduction of the United States, which completely shifted the power balance in Europe. Uh, to the point where Germany was now contained uh, and, and the prospect of another conflict could be prevented by the introduction of the United States and its power. Um, and uh, I think Roy mentioned the Versailles Treaty. Uh, the Versailles Treaty reflected that new balance of power. The Versailles Treaty was a consequence of the American entry into the war. It was negotiated uh, heavily in accordance with the desires of the American president uh, and its entire apparatus of maintaining the peace after the war depended on centrally on the United States. The United States was the long pole in the tent of the Versailles Treaty, which uh, because it would have had the United States, first of all, uh, after the war, the United States had troops in the Rhineland as part of the occupation of German territory, which was the critical guarantee to the French that if Germany got back up on its feet economically, which the United States and Britain wanted it to do, that it wouldn't then turn its economic power into military power and invade France again, of course, which is exactly what happened. But that the Versailles Treaty was designed to prevent that from happening and gave the United States a central role on all the various commissions that the treaty set up to determine reparations, to determine war debt payments, to determine security, to find ways to uh, work among the powers. Um, and so when the United States voted uh, against the League of Nations Treaty and voted against uh, ratifying the Versailles Treaty, that was like pulling the tent pole right out of the tent. And so not surprisingly, the Versailles Treaty did not function as it was intended to function. Uh, and Americans, ironically, because, even though they were the cause of this breakdown of the European order, nevertheless, in the mood that they were in after defeating the League, looked at Europe and said, order is breaking down. We don't want to be involved in that. So having created the disaster, they then used the disaster as the reason not to get further involved. And that uh, is what led to the uh, an unbelievable abstention of the United States during the 1920s. Just as, a, as an example of how serious that abstention was, uh, for a while, the United States, the State Department, when it received letters from the League of Nations, would not open them 
because they feared that if they opened them, they would be yelled at by members of Congress like William Bora, who would say, you're, you're trying to back us into the League of Nations again. American diplomats who were sent to Europe had to go uh, incognito to conferences and not be represented there as American diplomats. That's how extreme it was. Uh, and as Roy indicated, and as I think uh, my book goes into in a way that I think most other histories don't. It was these, the, the decisions that Americans made in the 1920s to pull back from Europe after World War I because of their disillusionment with the consequences of World War I, which I, in my view, we often look at the 1930s as being the big turning point when the United States didn't take whatever actions or when Britain didn't take whatever actions it should. But in my calculation, it was really the 1920s where the peace was lost. Because by the time you get to the 1930s, by the time Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt is elected president, you already have Hitler in power. You already have the Japanese having invaded Manchuria, which turns out to be the beginning of their effort to conquer uh, uh, Asia. Uh, you already have Mussolini moving into his more aggressive phase. He's uh, getting ready to invade Ethiopia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was in the 1920s, as it often is the case, it is during the periods of apparent peace and lack of any obvious challenge that the peace is lost and the challenges begin to emerge. And I'm going to jump straight ahead to our present situation in the interest of coming to a close eventually. But if you think about why did the United States go to war in World War I, and why did the United States go to war in World War II? I, I guess I should spend a minute on that. You know, I think most people say the United States got into World War II because of Pearl Harbor. Uh, Americans were reluctant to get involved before then, uh, and Pearl Harbor was clearly what turned the debate in the United States, basically shut down what had been a long debate. But in my book, I look at a lot of the actions that the United States took prior to that in both Europe and in Asia uh, that led the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor and that led Adolf Hitler to declare war on the United States on December 11th, 1941. Uh, we as Americans, because this is our typical way of looking at the world in general, think we were just here minding our own business, nobody here but us chickens, and then next thing you know, somebody comes out of nowhere and blasts us, and so we have to do something in response. But of course, that's not the way that happened. Um, as you all know, the United States, uh, as it looked at Japanese expansion, especially after 1937 and the full-scale invasion of China, uh, began to take steps to try to slow down and uh, hopefully stop this Chinese, uh, this uh, uh, Japanese aggression against China, and began taking diplomatic steps and uh, ultimately economic sanctions, et cetera, uh, that uh, convinced the Japanese, or at least a wing of the Japanese military, that their only option was to act preemptively. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they were not, that was not prelude to an, an invasion of the United States. The Japanese had no capacity and no desire for that. Their real hope was that if they punched us in the nose hard enough, that the Americans would, would, uh, would give up essentially, and, and want to stay out of Asia entirely. That turned out to be a miscalculation. Uh, but, and in the case of Germany, uh, Roosevelt by 1940 would, had already begun arming the British, uh, and in addition began using the American Navy to uh, protect convoys, to, he put troops in Iceland to relieve British troops, etc. So it wasn't as if the United States was just sitting there minding its own business and then other people came and attacked it. What was the United States doing? It was expressing once again uh, its, its, its conviction, or at least a majority of Americans, because of course there was a great debate at that time, a majority of Americans were expressing their conviction that this, uh, this dual assault on what, was re what remained of the liberal world order was something that the United States ultimately uh, couldn't tolerate. And so if you ask me, why did the United States go to war in World War II, again, it was ultimately in defense uh, of a world order. Most people have been taught 
to believe that it was only a matter of time before Germany and Japan were going to attack the United States. I'm not, uh, based on, I would have thought that too, but based on the research I've conducted, I'm now no longer sure that that is the case at all. I think it's quite possible that Germany and Japan would never have attacked the United States. And so the easy excuse for World War II, which is we had no choice, uh, one of the points that I want to make in general, and I think is made in this book, is that we always have a choice. There's no such thing as a war of necessity for the United States. Every war the United States undertakes is a war of choice. Um, Americans don't like that, and, and I understand why. Because when you make a choice, the, the moral burden of that choice is higher. If you act out of necessity, well, who can blame you? You do whatever you have to do to survive. But if it's not necessity, if it's because we're trying to defend a certain kind of world order, which, by the way, brings with it an element of imposition on the rest of the world, Americans get very uncomfortable with that. They don't want to think that they're imposing anything on anybody, but they are. And I think that is the issue that we are in a way facing right now. And I'll end by talking a little bit about Ukraine. If you think about, again, what is America doing in this conflict, uh, it is not defending, I think we would all agree, immediate American security or even, Ameri even medium term security. Uh, what it is doing is defending a liberal world against the biggest threats to that world. Um, and, and, the, and yet, we have no language for talking about that. Uh, Mitch McConnell, as I mentioned, says America has vital national security interests in Ukraine. I can agree with that as long as we understand what we're actually saying about that. Um, and I think what we're seeing today in the debates about American foreign policy are the same things we've seen about the debates about American foreign policy since in this entire period that I've been talking about, which is a number of people pointing out, wait a second, our security is not threatened in Ukraine, so why are we doing this? And a lot of other people saying we're doing it because democracy is at risk, and if we don't stand up for democracy, who is? And there, in a nutshell, uh, is the debate that I think has been uh, tearing at the United States ever since the United States acquired great power. And the consequence of that debate has been an interesting pattern in American foreign policy. There's been this constant oscillation between periods of high intervention, high involvement, high engagement, followed by periods of disillusionment, withdrawal, retrenchment, and a desire to stay as far away from the rest of the world as possible until things start happening in the world that look like they're getting scary again, and then Americans go from indifference to panic in like a minute. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, we're back and thinking about what do we need to do uh, to deal with the challenges that are out there in this world. And that is the phase that we're in right now. Uh, we've had the shock of recognition. I think for those people who believed, as Americans frequently have believed throughout their history, that the world had finally calmed down, that there was globalization, that there was convergence, that it was the end of history, that liberalism was going to be triumphant, that countries don't invade countries for territory anymore. I don't know how many times I argued with people over the past few decades who said that there is no more territorial conquest in the modern world because it makes no sense. Uh, that is a, a very, because it, everything is about economics and you don't need to conquer territory in order to benefit economically from it, which by the way was exactly the argument made by Norman Angel uh, before World War I uh, when he declared that war had become obsolete uh, as a tool of international relations. So we're constantly in this mode of thinking that we have escaped all that and I would say it's pretty clear that Putin's very 20th century style invasion of Ukraine, which is now industrial warfare of a kind that the Germans and Russians would have understand stood outside of Stalingrad, uh, that this has been an awakening for Americans, that the world remains a dangerous place, that the structure of the international system which has been roughly the same for 120 years, uh, is once again uh, being challenged. And Americans have once again reached one of those forks in the road where they have to decide, are they going to continue to 
preserve this liberal world, world order that they restored after World War II, uh, or are they going to go through another period in which things begin to get out of hand before they take any action? I think I know where things are going now, but as always, politics matters. Um, and we can see what's happening now in the Republican Party primarily, and, and in certain parts of the Democratic Party as well. I think we are now in the midst of one of these national debates about what we should be doing in foreign policy, and my attitude toward that is bring it on. We need to have the debate. We need to talk this through. We can't just say we don't. Uh, we can't be the way we were on this. In this case, on February 22nd, if you would ask any American professional or uh, or not whether we had vital interests at stake in Ukraine, the answer would have been no. And on but on February 24th, the United States began to devote substantial resources, and we've gotten to the point where we are spending a lot of money, but we're also not that far from the possibility, at least, of armed conflict. Um, you know, we, we didn't want to get into World War II either. We hoped we could solve all the problems by aiding uh, the British and let them win the war uh, until ultimately that proved that it was not going to be successful. So we are at that moment. And I, and I must say, uh, I think it's an important moment in our history. Uh, and I do think we should have this discussion uh, as openly and as candidly as possible. And I'm glad you've got Trita Parsi coming because she comes from the Quincy Institute, which thinks that I'm an insane person who's going to get us all killed. And so it's good that you'll get to hear the other side uh, of that story. So let me end with that and, and look forward to your questions. I know I went very quickly through a lot of American history, but if you want to take a longer, <laughs> enjoyable trip through that history, I have an answer for you. <laughs> I will just start with the first question um, that uh, of some of the characters that intrigued me in your book. Uh, uh, one of them is Senator Bora. Um, this is uh, he was from Idaho, Idaho. Uh, and um, he was uh, maybe the single most conservative, most isolationist uh, Senate senator. And, and at a later point, he became chairman of the committee, if I recall. Um, but he's sort of the quintessence of uh, of uh, isolationism. Um, and uh, and he summed it up. Well, it, it just intrigues me. He's sort of one pole, one pole of the American debate, uh, certainly. Um, the other pole that I found uh, at several points in your book that uh, of, of real fascination was that um, Americans react and recoil uh, with horror at some of the uh, atrocities that occur. In, in the course of war in uh, in Europe, and were uh, you know I don't think the, the Munich Agreement disturbed them so much, but Kristallnacht uh, really did, <clears throat> and I found that a, a fascinating point. You know this attitude uh, that uh, you are your brother's keeper in some way, and that you can't just watch these things and do nothing about it. Uh, not that people knew what to do, but it did change. Me. But I'm just wondering if you could look at those two poles of American. Um, moral sentiment <clears throat> and um, and just see how that how that tension uh, d developed and, and how it finally resolved. Uh, Bora is a fascinating uh, uh, character uh, and a very important uh, part of the story. And, uh, you know, as have you ever been to Idaho? <laughs> Well, I was recent, I was in Idaho a year ago, and you know you stand in Idaho, and everywhere you look are mount. You can stand in parts of Idaho. Everywhere you look is mountains. I don't blame people who live in Idaho for wondering why it matters to them what is happening in Europe, um, because it seems so infinitely far away and uh, so irrelevant uh, to your daily life. So, in a way, I'm not surprised that to find the senator from Idaho. Uh, being among those who thought the United States really didn't have to get involved in the world and shouldn't. And I think it's worth uh, remembering what the arguments, uh, Borodot was dead by the time uh, they had the so-called great debate in 1940 and 1941 uh, with the America First Committee and the Republican Party basically arguing against intervention. Uh, but. But the argument of Bora and the other anti-interventionists, that's great. I'll take any, any, any liquid will do. Thank you. Um, it's worth recalling that not only did they feel that it was not necessary for the United States to get involved, but they argued uh, 
that if the United States was going to get involved in these kinds of things, then the United States was going to become an empire itself, just like the Germans that we were fighting against. In fact, numerous uh, opponents of intervention in that period said, what you're talking about imposing American preferences on the world uh, by force. And of course, there was, there was real truth in that. And so they feared that America would embark on a career of empire. At least they claimed to fear that. And that was certainly one of the arguments. It wasn't only that we didn't want to send uh, our soldiers to die overseas. It was that our moral culpability uh, was going to uh, be great if we started uh, getting involved uh, in the world. And so, and the thing about Bora is that it, he was a conservative, if you think isolationists are conservative, but his, but his political orientation was progressive. Um, you know, on economic issues, he was basically progressive. And so, and there was a great, uh, a perfectly reasonable marrying of progressive attitudes, uh, especially if insofar as they shaded into a belief that the American capitalist system was, was not the, not the ideal system and needed to be modified. Um, and, and that often fit well with uh, a belief that foreign po that uh, that an engaged foreign policy, not to mention war, uh, would strengthen those elements of society that we were trying to weaken, i.e., bankers, munitions makers, corporate heads, etc. It was it was typical for progressives in that period to say that it was only the rich who wanted to go to war because the rich would benefit from the war and it was the poor who died in the wars. And so that was a good, you know, solid progressive position, which, which for Bora pulled everything together, the domestic and the foreign. And by the way, this is something I didn't get into in the talk, but which I go into in great deal, great, de great detail in the book, is this nexus between foreign policy and domestic policy. Uh, America, in part, because foreign policy is always a choice, Americans have a tendency more than other powers even to play out their domestic disputes on the foreign policy canvas. Um, and we see this in terms of the preferences that different Americans have for different uh, governments and world leaders around the world. So for instance, uh, this is a very long answer to Roy's question, but for instance, you know, the, the Republicans and conservatives uh, believed that communism was the great threat. They accused Franklin Roosevelt of being a communist and wanting to impose a communist system. I'm talking about mainstream Republicans, by the way, in case you forgot. They accused Franklin Roosevelt of being uh, at heart a communist. And therefore, as they looked out on the world, the number one enemy from their point of view was the Soviet Union. And as they looked at Hitler and Mussolini, they saw them as checks against communism. In fact, that's how Hitler sold himself as, as the bulwark against the Slavic communists. Um, and so there was a certain, if not active sympathy for Hitler, there was certainly a desire to sort of give him a pass because the real enemy was the Soviet Union. You, you won't be surprised to know that if you were an FDR Democrat in this period, you took exactly the opposite view. Your fear was that fascism was the great threat, fascism domestically and fascism internationally. You know, Sinclair Lewis wrote a book, It Could Happen Here, which was about the rise of, fa a, a theoretical rise of fascism in the United States. Uh, and so the, the liberal left side of the spectrum thought Hitler and Mussolini were the great threats, and they kind of turned a blind eye to the Soviet Union in that period because they had more sympathy with communism, and they saw the Soviet Union as being the bulwark against fascism. So, you know, it's, it's important as we talk about any of these characters to remember that a debate about foreign policy in the United States is never just about foreign policy. And it isn't today either, by the way, when you look at the way the arguments about Ukraine are distributed across the political spectrum. In 1938, two things happened. One was the Munich Agreement, which we look back on as the epitome of appeasement, but which I think most Americans were perfectly happy with. Roosevelt praised it publicly while, while, while criticizing the British and the French privately, but publicly he, he, he praised it as bringing peace. Um, but a little later, after Munich, came this incredible event, which was basically the worst pogrom 
against Jews in modern Europe, which was which had been known as Kristallnacht, which I'm sure you all know about. And interestingly, the reaction in the United States to Kristallnacht was much greater than the reaction to Munich. Um, Roosevelt himself said, said we couldn't believe this civilized nation would take part in such activities. And the idea that what, what, what Germany showed was a kind of uh, uncivilized, barbarous behavior, uh, as one historian has written, convinced Americans that whatever else was true, Germany was, uh, Nazi Germany was not part of the solution. Um, that, that's, that it was going to be very hard to fit Nazi Germany into a family of nations uh, that respected the things that Americans respected. And in a way, you know, it, the, Americans don't move right away, and, I, and therefore things get lost when you're looking at what influences Americans. So for instance, the sinking of the Lusitania did not lead Americans immediately to go to war, but it completely revolutionized the way Americans thought of Germans. That's where you begin to see the talk of the Hun and the barbarous nature uh, of, of German foreign policy. And it, it took a couple of it took almost two years for that to sink in and have its effect. But it was it was the background to the decision making in 1917, and Kristallnacht was in the background of decision making in the years to follow after 1938. Uh, I was a Moscow correspondent longer ago than I want to uh, acknowledge. And, and Russian leaders of, of every uh, political ilk uh, were saying that, uh, you know, if, if NATO expanded eastward, uh, it would be a direct threat to um, then the Soviet Union, to Russia. And, and in fact, NATO has, of course, expanded eastward. Um, the possibility of Ukraine becoming a NATO member, which would have been an absolute impossibility just two, three years ago, is now at least a remote uh, possibility. Um, uh, I wrote a column recently for USA Today about why great military powers develop a uh, uh, military amnesia so quickly. And I talked about you know, Russia, the failure in Afghanistan, and here they are in Ukraine, the United States, the failure in Vietnam, the, and then going into Iraq. I gave several other examples. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I didn't answer the question. I wish I'd interviewed you. But um, they always couch these uh, failed wars and failed occupations as necessities, not as choices. Why do you think that um, the greatest military powers, um, time after time again, now with Russia and Ukraine, uh, have failed occupations, failed wars, failed occupations that turn into debacles? I suppose that if you engage in enough interventions that some percentage of them are not going to be successful. I mean, you know, we we have this assumption that an intervention should be successful, um, but I think most wars end indeterminately. Um, and I think in the certainly in the Americans' case, um, we're always intervening very half-heartedly. Um, we're always reluctant to intervene, and we'd like to accomplish our objectives at the minimum at the minimum cost. Uh, and unfortunately, some of the objectives that we have cannot be accomplished at a minimum cost. So, for instance, if you want to talk about uh, Iraq, um, you know, I think I think it, it it is certainly clear in retrospect, and I think it was clear at the time that you needed a lot more troops if you were going to tr basically take, you know, ownership. As, as Colin Powell said, you, you break it, you own it. Um, so if you were going to do Iraq, which is a separate issue, but if you had decided to do it, you needed to do it with a lot more. But of course, Rumsfeld wanted to do it with as few troops as, as possible. He wanted to be able to find some way to just hand it over to the Iraqis as quickly as possible. And that just turned out not to be feasible. In the case of Putin, you know, why is Ukraine a debacle? Um, there are so many answers to that question. I don't think we know really exactly all of them. Certainly some percentage of them is just it turned out that the Russian military is so corrupt uh, and badly sort of run and badly resourced that they thought they could do something that it turned out that they really couldn't do. I mean, all of we all remember the the the, the 20 mile line of tanks and armored personnel carriers that were just stranded on a road out you know in Ukraine because the tires had never been properly cared for and they all collapsed uh, and so they were stuck there. That was because somebody didn't do what you have to do with the tires in peacetime to keep, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why, but I do think that 
the, the answer is uh, numbers. But I cannot think of it, you're certainly, I'm sure you would agree, I can't think of a single great power that has not at one time or another gotten bogged down unsuccessfully in one of these. Think of the French in Algeria, think of the British uh, in any number of places. America. Uh, right, in America, that's a good one. Uh, right, the British in America. So, you know, the question is really, what do you do after you've had that uh, experience? Now, if you're if you were British from anywhere from the, you know, late. 17th century to the early 20th century, you were, well, that was unfortunate. You know, the Boer War was a disaster, but we're not giving up the empire. We're, we get tough again and try to hang in there. Uh, whereas Americans, because of the nature of who we are, are like, wait a minute, why are we here? You know, what are we doing here? And so there's a, there is that, you know, that's when the tension between the choice of it all, uh, and as you say, of course, we always say it's for necessity, but even we know that. I mean, it's obviously not. Um, so I, you know, I don't. I don't have the the ultimate answer for you. Great talk. Um, but while the world order drives much of what America does, hasn't the American wars in the post Cold War era been driven by security concerns? I think the 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 two wars that were justified strictly on security grounds were Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, Afghanistan obviously was seen as a response to 9-11, and it was a perfectly logical place to look to, to make a response. But I do think it's worth remembering and, and recording that that still was a choice. Uh, there were other ways of, of addressing this problem other than invading Afghanistan. So, um, and Iraq was certainly a choice, but it was driven by fear. And this is something that I think has been, a lot of this has been distorted in our retroactive telling of the story of Iraq. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories, which by the way is another very common American trope. Uh, every war produces conspiracies about how we were led into it, um, especially the ones that are incredibly popular, like the Iraq war was. Um, and so, uh, uh, but but the truth is, I think it was obviously in a post 9-11 environment. Um, and, and all I would do is f let's forget about the Bush administration and Don Rumsfeld, etc. Read the floor speeches of Democratic senators uh, who voted for the war, of which there were 29 uh, Democratic senators, ranging everybody from Joe Biden to Chris Dodd to Tom Harkin. Uh, I could go on and on. So. Um, uh, those, you'll, what you'll read there is, 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 is the fear for security. Now, uh, was this a misguided fear in the case of, of Iraq? You know, if the question is, was American security directly threatened by Saddam Hussein, the answer is no, just as the answer is no in Ukraine today, just as the answer was no before World War I, just as the answer, in my opinion, was no before World War II. Okay, so what we're what we're left with then is if all these wars are wars of choice, how do we decide which are the right wars of choice and which are the wrong wars of choice? And and unfortunately, the the reality is that you don't know in advance necessarily. Uh, we want a, we'd like to have perfect information. We'd like to know that we, this is the wrong war at the wrong time. But how often have we nevertheless wound up in in conflicts? And we wound up in other conflicts which we don't talk about in this way. There was the war in Kosovo in 1999. There was American involvement in the Balkans in the 1990s, in the mid-1990s, um, uh, in Bosnia, et cetera. Um, and, and, and those are not part of our pantheon of disasters uh, because they didn't end as badly, um, or at least they didn't, they didn't have as bad a moment as Vietnam, Iraq, and, and Afghanistan. I don't know that that means that they were the right thing to do and the other ones were the wrong thing to do. I mean, you know, history plays itself out and then you can make a judgment. The harder part is making the judgment going forward. I'm sure people will be able to look back at some point. It might conceivably be the case that if, if things go in a certain direction, that people will say it was a mistake to arm Ukraine because it prolonged the war and ultimately it dragged us into it. Imagine a situation where the United States has been dragged into the war. Will we then go back and say it was a mistake to, uh, to get into this in the beginning? And yet most people in this room, I think, think it's the right thing to do now. Um, I, I didn't take a poll, by the way, so I don't want to jump to that conclusion. Um, but 
if, if this, this, I, this, this, I'll this, go so far as to say your average World Affairs Council crowd is of a, generally of a certain disposition, but I'll take a vote. How many people think it's in America's interest to be helping Ukraine the way we are currently helping them? And how many don't? Okay, I mean, it's pretty lopsided and, and good to you people for standing up for your position. But, but I would say once again, you have a great number of Americans who think this is the right thing to do, but when, if and when it goes bad, everybody's gonna say, wait a minute, who did got us into this? Um, and that happens over and over again. So this, this leads to another question. Would a US guarantee of Ukraine's sovereignty be sufficient incentive for negotiations? How does the war in Ukraine end? That's also a good question. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> would a US guarantee uh, help with the negotiations? I mean, First of all, let, I'll take Dave Petraeus' point first, which is how is the war going to end? It's not up to us how the war ends. In t you know, it's not like it's our call. Um, Russia will determine when the war ends because it's Russia's war. And the question of negotiation, unless Russia's really willing, unless Putin is really willing to end the war, a negotiation is only going to be a ceasefire until the next phase of the war. And, I, and that's what worries me. There are just whatever line is negotiated now, wherever it is, is going to be just the prelude to the next, uh, you know, the next series of conflicts. So the question is, where do you, where do we want to be uh, then for this next challenge. And if, if it ends, if the war ends with Russia in control of the Donbass and, and Eastern Ukraine as much as they currently have and Crimea, they will welcome the, the pause, rebuild their military capability. Putin is militarizing Russian society clamping down even more on any dissent from the war, and basically trying to recreate the Russian war machine of World War II. So any ceasefire is merely the pause while he gets his act together and, and then makes his next move. He's all in on this. Do you read his rhetoric? He is now saying this is a fight for the survival of the Russian Federation. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not gonna be easy for him uh, to back out. So uh, now, the end result of this must be some kind of security guarantee for Ukraine. I mean, what are we going to say? Having done all this, having reached some kind of peace agreement, we're going to say to Putin, hey, give it another shot. Let's see what happens. Um, I, I don't think that's wise. I think we have to make it clear. Now, ideally, our policy is going to be aimed at strengthening Ukraine so much that it doesn't really need other help. But I don't see how we end this without a security guarantee for Ukraine. And if the Russians are upset about that, they have only themselves to blame. You know, by the way, it was not Ukraine's entry into NATO that ultimately prompted Russian objections. It was NATO. It was Ukraine's desire to be part of the European Union, which is a completely economic and political organization, not a military organization, despite their pretensions sometimes. Um, and, and that was what he objected to. He objects to the fact, and this gets to the NATO question that you raised. First of all, let's discuss the, the threat to Russia. The reality is, if you look at the history of the past 300 years, Russia has never enjoyed greater security on its Western front than it has since the end of the Cold War. It was invaded by Napoleon. It was invaded by the Germans twice. During the Cold War, it theoretically had to prepare for a possible invasion by NATO. But since the end of the Cold War, even as NATO has expanded, the forces that Russia has fa faced across the, the, the divide have, with, have had withdrawn. The United States had pulled out of almost every frontline state uh, uh, by the time the war had started. And the general view was that, uh, you know, we, we, it was unclear how we could even defend some of these NATO countries that we'd taken in, in the Balts in particular, because of their proximity to Russia and their distance from us and the fact that we had not beefed up our military capacity to deal with it. So 
the, 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 the hard reality is Russia did enjoy security from invasion from the West during this period. What is it that Putin objected to? What Putin objected to was the loss of his sphere of hegemony. Uh, Russia for, his, for centuries had been at least hegemonic in Central and Eastern Europe. There were times when half of Poland was part of Russia. Uh, the Russian government from the czars to the present have always regarded Poland as a country that needs to be under the Russian thumb. Needless to say, they don't accept the legitimacy of, Balt of the Baltic states' independence at all. Never mind Ukraine, never mind Georgia, never mind Moldova, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately for Russia, they did lose the Cold War. And the consequence of losing the Cold War was that all those nations that had been under the thumb of Moscow during the Cold War wanted out. They didn't want to be under Russia's thumb anymore. So they came to the United States and said, and they came to Europe and said, please take us in because we don't want to be the next victim of Russian aggression, whether there is going to be a next victim or not. And also we want to be part of the West because we've been suffering as part of the communist bloc. And now we'd like to get, make some money and like live a decent life and like be free and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And our only option at that point was to say yes or no. Should we have said no? Would the world be better today if we'd said no? Or would the front lines in the conflict today be Poland, not Ukraine? Um, so to my mind, I understand, you know, from a, from a Russian point of view, the humiliation of the lost. You know, countries that have, been, that have lost wars are angry and humiliated. Look at Germans after World War I. It has nothing to do with, was it their fault that the war started? Yes. Did they lose fair and square? Yes. Uh, is life tough? Yes. But that doesn't stop them from being bitter and wanting back what they lost, which they then tried to attain by force. Okay. And so this happens, but that doesn't mean that it's a legitimate concern, really. That they, they behave as great powers behave, but we don't have to credit it as being a legitimate reason why we are somehow responsible for the conflict. Um, the United States is responsible in the following way. Our power, our power of attraction is so great that these countries that live on the borderlands of other countries that they find threatening look to the United States for help. And that's true in Asia too. The scarier China looks, the tighter US-Japanese relations get. Okay, and the Chinese can say, oh my God, you're surrounding us, you're containing us, etc." And that's true, we are. But it's partly in response to what they're doing. We couldn't contain China if Japan was not afraid of China, if India wasn't afraid of China, if Korea wasn't afraid of China, if Australia, Vietnam, and, and all the rest of those countries, Indonesia, and everybody else out there. Um, it's, it, so we need to understand that dynamic as we look at these kinds of questions. Given what we know today with China, okay, well now we're back in the 30s and 40s, just like the other conflicts you've been talking about. Communist Chinese rise up, they're fighting the nationalist Chinese. We have our hands full with the Japanese and the Nazis. What do you think we could have done different or where might that have gone <laughs> different than today? As an American who grew up uh, honoring the Munich Pact as, the, as the, uh, the big mistake that led to aggression, I'm gonna push back on the notion that the wars of choice are hard to discern. I think World War II clearly was the right choice, and I think supporting Ukraine clearly is the right choice. There are aggressive powers that need to be stymied, whereas you could look back in Vietnam and say, a little more nuance and study would have revealed that they were more nationalist than communist and not looking past their own borders. Um, so I would say um, maybe do you, do you agree with that, or do you really feel like the wars of choice are, are all ambiguous going in and easy to see on the way out? Um, with regards to propaganda, which seems to run American um, views for or against communism, fascism, democracy, all that good stuff, um, is the propaganda most effective for indifference or panic? You asked that about the cycles of from indifference to panic. Which one's more effective for the propaganda? Can you explain what you mean by propaganda, just so um, I understand? I mean media. I also mean um, now, I guess, social media. I mean 
Um, you mean pro-war or pro-doing something media or, or anti-Russian media or anti-Chinese? All of that is propaganda. Okay. So I mean, because Well, everything saying, is propaganda. But, what you're doing right now is propaganda. I mean, where, where do I draw the line, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. Because with the U.S., um, and given I'm, not, I'm from the U.S., but for a generation, um, with the U.S., a lot of what people um, take as fact is from propaganda, mm -hmm. including what I'm doing right now. So, <laughs> yeah, as, as we said, so which one's more effective for, as from a psychology background, um, if the people are indifferent or in a state of panic, in which way does foreign affair propaganda, which way is more um, productive? Yeah. Given the war on how Iran, how Syria, how Afghanistan went, um, what is to say that Ukraine is any kind of real breaking some kind of necessity factor? Like, do we really need new Ukraine more than we needed the others? Will this war matter more than the others that we do not do the best in? Right. Is there nothing out there that is worth fighting for beyond America's borders? Because if the answer is yes, if, if your answer is no, then that's simple. If the answer is yes, then things get very complicated. Because in all these cases, you can make a case that American security in some way eventually was threatened. Certainly in Afghanistan and Iraq, we'd been hit by terrorists who were still there. And by the way, who were coming back uh, in Afghanistan. So that, I think, is an answer to your question. We may have messed up the conflicts for reasons that I think we can all you know, discuss. But suffice to say, at the time, I doubt most people in this room thought it was a mistake. I think most people thought it was the right thing to do at the time. I know there were people who didn't. I, I, I know who they are. There aren't that many. But in any case, in each case, we did feel that there was much at stake. Now, the messing it up part, if the messing it up part is the determining factor, then I think maybe we should never get involved in anywhere because you can always mess it up. But I do think that what we're, the question is not so much about, it is about Ukraine, and, and I think people care about the Ukrainian people. But the question is, what is the trend? What happens after Putin takes Ukraine? Because then he's not finished. So the question is, at what point do we want to draw the line? You know? And if the answer is nowhere, that's an answer. But if the answer is somewhere, then you're going to have to make arguments as to why it's worth us potentially messing up to defend Poland as opposed to defending Ukraine. You know, it's the same situation, it's just in a different place. My view is Putin is a lot easier to deal with while he's bogged down in Ukraine than after he takes Ukraine. Uh, at that point, you know, if you look at a map of Europe, Ukraine is a huge country, and the possession of Ukraine by Russia puts, you, puts Russia, effectively, Russian troops, on the borders with Poland and other, and other of our NATO allies, which we're committed to defending, right? So we will have increased the threat that our, uh, to our NATO allies, which we're committed to defending, in which case we might have to fight an even bigger war. So, I mean, then, that may... Then how can you say sir, because, because even, because as I said, when Putin, when the Soviet Union controlled all of Eastern Europe, which was the period from 19, you know, from, the, from World War II until 1991, uh, was that an intolerable situation for the United States? No, it wasn't intolerable. In fact, some people think that some of those years were our best years, you know? So I can't say that even in the worst circumstances, and this is, the, this is the thing about American foreign policy, even in the worst circumstances, um, it's not necessarily the case that America is directly threatened by this. So when you act, yeah, defending the NATO alliance, but who has, why do we have to defend the NATO alliance? There are people, Josh Hawley is calling for the withdrawal of, of American forces from Europe and NATO. And, so, and sending you know, them to China. Uh, and sending, sending them, them to China, to right. Anyway, uh, there's so, much to talk about, and obviously yes. we're not going to finish it all right here. What's so interesting is that this, this is a debate, and it's a legitimate debate, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's a timely debate. And I think the, the positions that uh, members of the audience have expressed here are probably uh, 
uh, maybe not so well articulated, but they are alive right. and, and well in the country. And and having having you to to respond, I think, has been excellent. I did predict, as you all will remember, that we would have a lively discussion. <laughs> so this is it. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, uh, Robert. Uh,